And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hello, everyone out there in Tampa Bay and beyond. This is James Knowles coming at you for the RBLR Sports Podcast. I am here after a very interesting new intro, Carlos. I didn't realize that we had that in the bank. Thank you. Rowdy Spirit fuels the race. Rowdy Spirit fuels the race, James. I've been saying this. I think we should. I'm going to put that on a T-shirt and. Maybe maybe someone will buy it, but it's going to be on a T-shirt. Um, James, we're here. We're live. It's 5.30 p.m. Um, bless our <laughs> – um, yeah, it's 5.30 p.m. It's a lovely – that's not a lovely day. There's lots of rain. Um, it's a gray out. Uh, it's just not a good time. Kind of like that game this past weekend against – Kind of like that game. Yeah, and then, you know, I guess we have to talk about it. Um, it's kind of what we do. Um, it's what they pay us for. They they don't pay us, but if they did, that is what we, we would be paid for. They um, pay James, us clicks, Carlos. You can't forget the value of clicks. Exactly, exactly. I love the idea of people listening to what I'm saying right now, and I guess that's enough for me, James. Um, one day, I'm sure there's going to be some big million dollar sponsorship coming our way. Um, I don't know, Taco Bell. If you're listening to this, I'd love to have like a like a you know chalupa ad break in here that'd be fun um but anyway james how are you doing before we jump into any more chalupas or oakland or louisville talk what's going on in your life in well now i'm wishing Tampa that Florida? i also had taco bell um yeah. i don't know if i want to drive out to get it right now because as you said it is very rainy it's very yep. dark um i'm enjoying the gray weather personally but i would not mind it being a little less wet outside as well Fair. Um, that would be good uh, as you said, though, Carlos, unfortunately, that is a great segue into a pretty dismal game from this past weekend. True. And it is one that we, as you said, get paid in clicks to cover. So we will do that here. Um, yeah, this past weekend, the Rowdies lost to Oakland Roots one to nothing. Who saw that coming? None of us. We got no points. No one predicted a loss. Carlos, you do stay the top of our own personal rankings with six, but we have to do a little more recap than just that, unfortunately. Uh, also, this weekend, we have a huge test coming up at home versus Louisville City. If you can get to Alang, you have got to do that. Get to Alang and make sure that the boys in purple are scared of the boys in green and gold. Hate that color. Need to do. Exactly. There's a lot of history with purple. So if you know anything about that, Make sure that you get your butt to Al Lang to scare it away. And uh, like I said, cheering on the green and gold. That's what we're here to do as fans, not just podcasters, but we're all fans naturally. Uh, before we get into anything, I do want to quickly say, please like and subscribe to us on YouTube, any major podcast platform. And of course, please follow us on social media, wherever you are. We are too at RBLR Sports. Now, Carlos, let's get into the Oakland Roots game from this past weekend. We'll do the quick recap. If we have to, um, here's your starting 11, which notably excluded Blake Bodley, who also wasn't on the bench, not listed in the injury report or anything like that. This was kind of a random surprise. Um, I don't know anything about that. I don't think, James, we've heard anything about why that was. Not yet. Um, Blake Bodley, not in this game. Um, Far was still in goal, as per usual. Jordan Doherty and Kleeman and Guillen were that back three. Kleeman getting that start um, at the center back role. Um, out on the wing back spots, you had Pacific and the Young Gabire. You had Eddie Manjoma, who moved out of that sort of central back role, center back, hybrid, whatever he was playing. Um, and officially took up that wing back role uh, without, uh, with bodily out. Um, in between them, you had Chris Ostomo and Hilton. Uh, and then up top, you had Cal Jennings and Artiaga. And more missing. That's 10, right? Dennis? Was Dennis playing? Charlie Dennis? Charlie Dennis. Dennis. He's Charlie a, Dennis. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And he was also there. He was doing that weird, you know, like kind of up top attacking midfield situation. Um, Robbie Nielsen called this game poor, quote unquote. The Rowdy just couldn't really put it together. Of course, it came after, I think, one of our best performances of the year. Um, after one of your best performances of the year, obviously, you have to have one of your worst performances of the year. Is that too harsh? I don't know. Maybe it'll be an up and down that continues. Let's hope for that for just this week and then that stops. Yeah, it, it was a boring one. We'll put it lightly. Um, Sedano scored in the second half, and that was it. Leo, by the way, Leo Fernandez came in late in the game. He continues his comeback. Um, that's about all the good news we'll have from this game. Uh, it wasn't a fun one, James, at all. We'll jump into it, break it down a bit more. Light on chances for both sides. Um, decent opportunities for the Rowdies, maybe in the first half, a couple. Um, Cal Jennings had a couple opportunities, which he kind of 
unfortunately just didn't really have a great window shot it right at their uh, keeper not really an opportunity where i would say that was a clear scoring chance maybe maybe an artiaga header in the first half maybe um but light on opportunities for both sides by the way um standings update we'll jump into this game a bit more but Hartford and Rhode Island drew 1-1. Louisville City won again. They are hot. And guess who we're playing this weekend? Um, other than that, Louisville City, again, still on top. Um, behind them, you have Charleston Battery with 29 points. They've played an extra game in the Louisville, by the way. So they're behind by four points, and they've played an extra game. Indy 11 stays hot as well, by the way. 14 games played, 26 points. Um, and right behind them, your 10 Bay Rowdies were in fourth place with 22 points with 13 games played. So we have that game in hand over our peers from Charleston yeah. and Indy. Uh, sadly, our friends down in Miami only have seven points. They lost again. Um, that's however many straight losses in a row. I kind of lost track, and I feel really bad for our friends down there. But there's not really many people to feel bad for, honestly. Um, there's like, what, 12 Also people? true. Yeah, whatever. Um, West Coast, New Mexico lead with 25 points from 12 games. Sac Republic have 24 points from 13. Monterey Bay sneaking in here, playing pretty good football this early part of the year. Uh, they're tied with Phoenix. They both have 19 points. And El Paso, by the way, sneaking up the table. Not really. They're still in last place, but they're sneaking up with points with 11 points. So they're only two points behind. They're so, not last in the league. So you could say sneaking up the table. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, sure. Cumulative table, whatever. <laughs> is technically, yeah, last year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's where we're at right now, James. That's Those are the standings around the league. Um, a couple teams still really hot. A couple teams not at all. Um, Charleston Battery, by the way, uh, with this past weekend's result against Pittsburgh, they tied 0-0. Um, that's three straight games for Charleston without a win. That's a team that's been hot all year. It's kind of found themselves in a bit of a slow patch for a team that's been feeling like winning every game um they've they had that weird loss against el paso a few weeks back tied against monterey bay tied against pittsburgh at home um so slow patch for charleston hopefully that continues gives us a little bit of time to jump up the table with a few more good results looking ahead we'll get into those games coming up including a big one against louisville but james before we do that let's talk about this snooze fest um out in oakland uh, is the best way i'll put it um it was 10 p.m it was way past my bedtime on a saturday night uh that makes me feel really that's not true well i, I was in college like a few months ago i could stay up late james um long story short i was sleepy the game did not help um what yeah, happened right exactly. this game james what the hell happened i mean we're coming off of that sacramento game it was a game that by all accounts felt like the best performance of the season um, despite only being a one goal performance playing arguably the best team in the league certainly one of the best teams in the league we might be playing the best team in the league this upcoming weekend um had a great performance out in california um, stayed out in california mm -hmm. didn't come home um you know no reason to make that you know long trip back and forth um Rowdy's in theory would have been adjusted to the time difference by this point coming in with a full week of training out there in the west coast went into Oakland and played so slow. Why'd that happen, James? Give us an account of the James analysis of this game. Because I, I really don't know. Blake Bodley missing seems to have been a huge factor for me. Um, Manjoma and Neon Gabir on the wings are serviceable. They're both fantastic players. But Blake Bodley has been a different animal this year. And that last minute kind of figuring out what to do without him maybe the rowdies had more time to figure that out we didn't know anything about blake bodley not being in this game it felt like we missed him a ton what did you see i would definitely start with blake bodily being an important factor and his absence being uh the one of the most important factors for the rowdies now yeah, it was uh, it was weird because, as you said, they did stay out in California. The Rowdies media schedule includes location, California, 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 California. It doesn't yep. get much. Uh, it doesn't get any uh, more specific than that. But obviously, it's OK for them to not when they're in an area that none of them are really used to, I guess. It was just kind of funny to see that either way. Yeah, I think that the Rowdies were it, it was also. It's it's hard to play away from home in general. So that's fair. I think that the Oakland Roots team really looked at this as a very big game for them. They've been, as you guys noted uh, last week, you and Liz noted last week that Oakland has actually been a little bit on the up recently. 
Yeah. And they have been doing better than when they had a coach that they had to fire because they were doing so poorly. Obviously, it does balance itself out a little bit like that. But I think that the one one of the main things when it comes to playing away is the difference in fields. You have uh, you have the Pittsburgh Riverhound Stadium, which is a pretty nice stadium in terms of lower league soccer, but it's a turf field and it's a little bit smaller, so it's harder to play on for us. I think that Charleston has a full field, and when we play North Carolina, they definitely have a full field. So those ones you would expect that we would have a bit better time. Then you think of Memphis, and they're playing on a not converted uh, baseball field. That doesn't help things at all. And I don't know how to describe this field, Carlos. It's 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 weird. not a it's not a baseball field. It's turf, but it's also I I don't know. It's just weird because they have the different lines broken up by different colors. So it's it's kind of like a a zebra that's gotten sick or something. And uh, I don't know exactly how much that impacts our players' ability to get out there because we do like to play the ball on the ground and pass it around and keep it close as best we can. And that is generally one of the, generally one of the factors that goes towards rowdy success. And uh, I don't know that this field does allow us to do that. So this is something that we're going to have to either play our way into. If we're thinking about the playoffs in the future, we're going to have to do so well that we are mostly hosting our playoff games, or we're going to have to learn to do a little bit better on the road. And as you said, we had a really great game on the road just the week before. So yeah. um, maybe it was just uh, the other thing that it could be, and I could possibly chalk it up to this if I'm being uncharitable, because it's it's hard to ever say that one game or another comes down to this factor, but we're all thinking it at times, and maybe it's a little bit of complacency. The Rowdies obviously are a very good team. They're doing quite well overall. Unfortunate that we're even out of the open cup after that game against FC Dallas. But other than that, one, about that, let's not talk about that. Yeah. Other than that one, we've been doing very well for most of the month of May, most of the month of April, we had a very good month. Um, so yeah, other than a couple of hiccups, we've been doing pretty well. We come up against Sacramento, the only undefeated team left in the league. And you guys already covered that one last week. We did a great job of shutting them down and setting ourselves up to create some chances where we had some success. Yeah. Here, we're looking at Oakland and maybe, just maybe, possibly the team expects that this one will be a little bit easier of a game. I and do. yeah, exactly. If you think about the way that all of us think about it, it's probably natural that the players might have this in the back of their minds as much as... They might want to play the psychological game, whatever that entails for them, to try and pump themselves up ahead of the game. It might still be in the back of their minds that, well, this is a this is a team that's not doing as well as Sacramento. They're not as good by and large. So however it's going to go. And then unfortunately, it goes just as you said, Carlos, it goes very slowly. It turned into 15 shots overall for us. Only four of those were on target, of course. That's a very important factor. Still, we created three big three big chances, and three Great. big chances is nothing. But we missed all of those. And, um, yeah, I, I think that, it, I, it again, this is something that it's very hard for me as an outsider, not, you know, involved with the team, in the locker room, all that kind of stuff, what have you. It's very hard for anybody to say. Uh, any one game comes down to complacency, but maybe if that was maybe that was a possibility here, I will definitely throw it out. When it came down to the way that we played, we lined up the way that we usually do, except as you noted, Blake Bodily was out from the start. He also wasn't on the uh, he wasn't on the injured list. So I don't know. He made the trip because he was out there for Sacramento. Yeah. So I don't know if he had missed the game because he was subbed off late in the Sacramento game. I don't know if there was something there that they were checking on him game to game, day to day, or excuse me, day to day, and make sure that he was ready. And then it turned out he wasn't. Sure. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more information this week. But Eddie Manjoma stepped in from his usual defensive position to go to the left wing back position. Uh, that is a switch up for him because he is more used to playing on the right side. Yeah. Actually, um, had a good game. Yeah, I thought that he did pretty well there. And especially when you consider that he had to switch sides uh, going into the second half. And then the other big switch was Freddie Kleeman coming in and playing at the back. Although I thought he did relatively well too. 
Uh, it was his first start in a long time, I believe only a second start all season. But sure. um, yeah, it, it's interesting to consider these couple little changes where I think that this was really cutting us off was uh, Oakland Roots was getting into a lot more positions to press us when we had the ball. And uh, this was something especially noted by John Morrissey. So I don't want to take credit for noticing it myself originally because um, John was the one that I saw that pointed this out after the game. And I went back and watched it and I said, oh, yes, now I see what that was. But um, it was a lot of good pressing by Oakland Roots to shut down the uh, Aaron Gian and Jordan Doherty options when we had the ball and or shut down yeah. their options when they had the ball. And yeah, I wonder where getting forward, um, we are usually going to, well, we're usually going to face teams that are pressing us because often we will have more possession, especially at the back with those two guys. So trying to be able to connect from the back to the front is going to be something that we're needing, that we're going to need to focus on in the future. And um, especially in these away games where we're playing on plastic pitches, where we're playing on smaller fields, when we're playing on all sorts of different surfaces, People want to put us under pressure. They're going to put us under a lot of uh, pressing defensively. And I, I was, I don't know. I was hopeful that it would turn into something a little bit better than it obviously did, but yeah. I don't think I'm alone in that. No, I mean, I'm echoing what you're saying. Um, it's, I think I, I, I was talking to my dad about this. We were watching the game and it just felt like, well, okay. So let me qualify this by saying I think everybody kind of knows what the Rowdies game plan is, and that's yeah. usually not been a problem because we're really good at executing that, um, especially on like normal fields, right? Like a, um, you know, a soccer field, not a baseball field or not whatever Oakland was playing on. Right. Um, I that. Oh, my God. By the way, let me just give a shout out. Whatever the opposite of a shout out is like what the what the negative of a shout out is, whatever Oakland was doing with their stream. Good lord! Yeah, I mean, yeah, th it was ter. It was so bad. Like the quality was terrible. The, the it was just constantly breaking up, and the field colors, whatever they were doing with like the stripes on the field, did not help with, <laughs> with the broadcast. It was so bad. Um, and that field, for whatever reason, um, I'm sure, um, being whatever it is, synthetic, artificial turf, um. Did not help the Rowdies game plan. And it always seems to happen whenever we play on like a non, you know, soccer type field, more narrow field. Um, it's a lot harder for us to kind of play that game that everybody knows we want to play. So, it, but regardless, we're going to keep trying it. Um, and that's kind of frustrating. It's really frustrating in a game like in an Oakland game where it's not working at all, but like we're just going to keep doing it. Yes. Um, there was one cross that I'm recalling. Let me check my notes again. Let me look, look back because I, I took a couple moments here. This was the 17th, 18th minute. It was a cross um, from Nyangabira. Beautiful cross, by the way, to Arteaga, um, who fought off uh, one of Oakland's defenders and got good contact on the ball. It was a like, solid, solid header, um, but an easy enough save for the Oakland goalie. Um, and that was about that was about the only time one of those many a crosses um, worked. Um, it, it's the only time I can pinpoint here. Cal Jennings had a decent opportunity off of a long ball towards the end of the half. Um, there's another opportunity that Cal had um, later um, where he kind of had Charlie Dennis to his right, but not really. I won't blame him for not passing it there. Again, another long ball opportunity. Um, that's about it. I Honestly, I don't know where Fought Mob comes up with these three big chances because looking back, I was trying to figure out what those might be <laughs> i count i count maybe maybe two maybe and, and that, i think that's pushing it like you probably have one and it's one of those cal jennings looks that he kind of just boots right at the oakland goalie um yeah maybe I'm, I'm, I'm i said this last week like i'm wanting a little bit more out of cal jennings it feels like he kind of set the bar so high for himself this year like with such a hot yeah. start that it's easier for me to notice like those like little mistakes, maybe not passing the ball to a Charlie Dennis when Charlie might have had a much cleaner look at goal um in this game, or or yeah, just kind of like the lack of the finishing touch that we were used to him having. Um, it's been a little more absent in the past few games. But I think in this game, with such limited chances, and then mostly coming from Cal Jennings, it's easier for me to notice, obviously, um, when the ball's not going in. 
and they're not particularly like threatening shots. It's been it, it was pretty easy work for the Oakland goalie throughout the game, honestly. Um, and the most dangerous one was probably that Arteaga header. Um, why that is, I don't know. Maybe Cal Jennings is having, you know, like he, he's been so hot. Like he's scoring goals like every other game at least. Um, I'm sure going a few games without a goal is probably a bit of a switch up for him this year. Um, whatever. Maybe that's a mental thing. Like you said, James, we're playing down to our opponent or whatever. Um, I don't know. It felt like Oakland wasn't – like we, we were conscious of the fact that Oakland wasn't as bad as they look in the table, especially because they'd won two of their last three games. Um, that's three of the last four. Um, they knew yep. – we knew we were playing in their field, on their turf. They know how to play on that weird little field. They do. <laughs> you know. Plenty of teams around this league that say I like to be a little different, you know, play on their strange little turf fields and, and strange, very narrow, you know, whatever they play on. Um, Oakland was really comfortable in this one and didn't seem to feel too threatened by anything we did, um, which was unfortunate because I felt like we should have beat this team. Like, hey, yeah, it's a bit of a trap game, but it's a trap game for a reason. Like we're the right, better right. team, right? Um, missing Blake Bodley is, is really, really unfortunate. Um, maybe one of those crosses has a little bit more quality on it and because he's Blake Bodley and he's been having an awesome year. Maybe he dribbles into the box a bit more, like, you know, a little bit more than Nyan or Monjoma. Um, that being said, both those guys had fine enough games, by the way. Um, but it's just, like, it wasn't working with Oakland's back line. They had one guy whose name I'm forgetting. They have one, like, huge, huge guy on their back line. Um, maybe, what's this guy's name? Um, Oh, I'm going to butcher his name. Gagi Mark Villashavili. Guy from Georgia. Great We're country. We're going to take Georgia. that. Not the state of Georgia, from the country of Georgia. 6'4". Um, Hackshaw, six foot. But our friend Mark Villashavili. I'm sorry, friend. Carlos, you're never um, going to get that job in the Georgian uh, embassy that you wanted. Yeah, it's not happening. It's not happening. Um, throw that one out the window. Um, <laughs> whatever. Point is, guy's 6'4". None of those crosses were making their way to Artiaga or no. Jennings um, in the air. And that's what we kept doing over and over and over in this game. And it was so frustrating to watch. Like, I, at one point, I, I got so tired of it. I just, like, I put the, the Mexico-Brazil game back on because it was more fun to watch Brazil, like, destroy Mexico, which didn't end up happening, by the way. It ended up being a great game. Mexico tied it with a 3-2 at the end. Um, so it was a weird one. It was a weird one. Um, it didn't go the way any of us thought it would, I think. But I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I takeaways from this game, James. Like looking ahead, um, you might have mentioned this. You did mention this, talking about just being better on the road. Yes, um, I think it's particularly important to just kind of be mentally ready to play wherever you play in this league. It's a yeah. little bit of a toss up because again, there's strange fields out there. Um, Oakland had a pretty good atmosphere. Uh, also, uh, the crowd seemed to be into it. They hit their record crowd um, for a game um, in their existence. It was like 6,500. Good for them. Um, so it was a weird one. I don't know why we played down to Oakland, but we did. We've said that a couple times in the past few years um, in terms of playing down to opponents. It's frustrating because you know you should beat them. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm telling you, Blake Bodley being in this lineup is a huge, huge difference. I hope it's nothing major. Maybe he just got like a, I don't know, maybe a food poisoning. Maybe the hotel food is bad. Who knows? Um, and it certainly has happened before, us Tottenham fans. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 well, ask, speak for yourself. Um, I'm not associating with Tottenham, by the way. I refuse. I feel like it's such like bad vibes to associate with Tottenham, by the way. It, it is, it's is definitely bad uh, vibes to associate with that club. I will not yeah, have it personally. No trophies allowed if you're a Tottenham fan. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for the opposite. I'm hoping for at least, at least, well, not at least. I want the big one this year, James. But performances like this won't happen, won't let us get there, um, especially if we're playing away to, you know, significantly better teams um, than Oakland. Yeah. Um, the, I don't know. Is, what, what's wrong with this one, James? Are we going to toss this one up to, like, away, you know, whatever, being? Uh, I'm going to say at least this is a, a mentality issue because all we've said so far is about how slow the game was. And just for the record, uh, Oakland Roots was missing a player to the international window. One of yes, the players yes. that I really like yes. from uh, – 
uh, one of the players that I really like from college soccer, Iracose Danasiano, I believe from the DC area, he plays for Oakland roots, but he was away with Burundi. He actually played for them today uh, in a three, one win. So good for him, but this is just, I, I think that overall this game comes down to the rowdies not being up for it mentally in the way that they need to. And I think that if Robbie Nielsen is going to go and call it a poor game, in his own post game notes, uh, the one that was put out to the reporters, such as we like to call ourselves, then yes, I think that that's fair to say that there was some type of mentality issue. Whether that comes down to this or that, who can say? I'm I'm just putting it out as a possibility. I didn't want to give it any more credence than that, but it, it could be down to a little bit of complacency, and that's where I'm going to leave it in terms of my speculation. But I will definitely call this one an intensity issue. And then if you look at what we're going to face the next week, obviously Louisville city is the opposite in many ways. They are a team that we have a big history with. They're a rival team in that sense. They wear the color we all hate like bulls with red. And uh, we're playing at home when they are on this really good streak right now. There really shouldn't be any intensity issues. So I think what we need to look for is making sure that next week, any problems that we did see this week are wiped out and the slate is clean and we're ready to go again. It's unfortunate that we had this dip, but let's just make sure that it was a dip and we can move on from it. If we, if that's the case, then you and I can look back at this week and just shrug and be like, well, what the hell? guess that's gone. And I'm glad it is. <laughs> yeah. Here's my thing, James. Like, I feel like the problem is we've said that like, a few too many times this year you know what i mean like we, we've we've had a couple of these like little dips and then we've had good results after that and it's like okay well we can throw those away we definitely had one against memphis yeah yeah so we, we've had a few of these like weird like it's insignificant like dips and then we throw them away because we had a good result um i think liz used a pretty good word last week um, to describe the rowdies she kept calling the rowdies um volatile i think was the word she was using um, kind of just bouncing around back and forth. And I, I think it's just easier for us to ignore these little dips when we get that signature win, signature-esque win, right? Um, whatever, I like I almost forgot about the Memphis game because we have had such, you know, pretty significantly good games since then, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, including yeah. that Sacramento game. Um, I'm sure if we beat Louisville this weekend, I won't be talking about this Oakland game for another several months until we right. get to the end of the year. And, and at the end of the year, we're like, well, where could we have? got more points maybe exactly. that oakland game right um so i just hope we don't really have to chat about any more dips for a long long time um it's really frustrating to like play down to an opponent like this and with all due respect to oakland i know they're kind of trending up um respect dom dwyer who came into the game and for whatever reason is playing for oakland i had no clue until we chatted with uh with john como from uh oakland from the roots blog um last week he came into that game later on for whatever reason um i'm i'm, I'm sure they're trending up i believe them i it, the results don't lie the three wins in the last four games I'm, i know they're trending up but it's still a game where i i don't really expect anything less than like a draw against a team um, that's kind of struggling to find that. Well, that is struggling to find their identity. Doesn't really know what's working. Doesn't really know who they are yet. Um, their attack doesn't really exist yet. They're trying to like put it all together. Um, we're about what, like a third of the way through the year. Nothing's really clicked for them yet um, until now. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate. It's certainly, I, I think again, this is fully speculation, like you said, it makes sense that we call it like a mental thing. There's not really much else to point to. But I will say there is something to be said about kind of everybody understanding what our game plan is and maybe thinking about how we fight that when it's not working. You know, like, okay, we get to halftime. Maybe, maybe okay, I'll give them a little more, more time. We get to like the 65th minute. We're in the 60th minute, and the cross is the same thing. Boom, 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 from like Manjoma and the young Avira. Just throwing the ball in understanding that there's a six four center back there winning every ball and not really changing that i think that's going to be a problem going forward if we don't know how to adjust things on the fly yeah um against a, a team that's defending really really well and oakland was defending really really well this game they did their job and they did it to uh, they, they did it perfectly obviously they got the shutout um they limited us chances wise to a few long ball opportunities that kyle jennings wasn't able to put away um, again, with all due, with, with, with 
all fairness, like they were tough angles. Um, they weren't really putting him in a fantastic position by any no, means. No. Um, that was about it. So it's like it's it's mental, but I think it's also something to be said about this kind of uh game plan that everybody knows we're gonna do. Um and we're gonna do it anyway. And again, usually it, it usually ish it's worked. Um, but there's gonna be good teams out there or teams that like Oakland that'll play a really good game um and know how to defend that. Um, especially away from home. It's going to be harder for us to impose that. And we've seen that year after year. Um, it's harder for us to impose our game, obviously, away, especially on these more narrow fields. I always I always think of Pittsburgh um, as a prime example of this. Yeah, um, It's been like almost impossible for us to go into Pittsburgh and play a really good game because the field's so narrow. They know how to defend us on that field. They know what we're going to do when we go over there. We're going to whip it out to the wings and throw balls into the middle, whether it was... Steven Dos Santos a few years ago, big guy you know, throwing a header, or JJ Williams, who was really good at getting headers, or now Artiaga or Jennings, whoever it was, we were throwing the ball into the middle. Um, and Pittsburgh has always been good at keeping us kind of grounded on their field because it's so narrow and they know how to play on their field. They know how to defend us on their field. Oakland might have taken a, a, a page from that book um, and, and was able to knock us out of that, you know, mindset or no, keep us from, you know, getting anything going with that mindset throughout the entire game. Um, and it certainly helps to have a six, four center back to be able to do that. So um, yeah, maybe we look ahead a bit more and we start thinking how tall the other team center backs are. And maybe we don't whip a ball in you know, every single chance we get um, when there's a guy that I, um, you know, defending everything we throw at him. So thought something to think about something to throw out there. Um, it's not the end of the world, um, but I would like to, get a good string of results going here because this team is really, really good. James, our roster is stacked and like, it's not, it's, it's not reached its potential. Um, but I think the bright side everybody can take away from the last few weeks is that we know we can play a really, really good game on the road yeah. against a team like Sacramento, a really, really good game, create a ton of chances. Um, we also know that we can play a really bad game on the road with almost the same team. Um, so, the positives take away from that is that we have not reached our potential at all. It's clear that there's so much more to reach here and that we can have a really, really good game against basically anybody in this league home or away. Um, we just have to be able to impose that kind of game plan. And clearly that wasn't able to work against Oakland, um, who is certainly not the best team in the league. Um, but I don't see why we wouldn't be able to figure that out at some point this year. It, you know, American soccer is great in that way. You only really need to figure it out for a few games by the end of the year yeah. when playoffs come around. So, hey, I'm okay with that. I would like to finish in first place, God willing, James, but who really knows where we will at this point? It seems like we're more in the mix for the third or fourth place spot. There's still plenty of soccer left to play. We're only, whatever, what, 14 games, we say, 13 games to the year. Um, plenty of soccer left to play, but that's kind of where we are at this point in the year. Um, and that was a long rant, so I'm going to shut up. No, you you covered most of the things. The only thing worth noting uh, other than that is um, we played well against Sacramento and Sacramento does have the full size field. So just keep that in mind, folks, when we are going forward. Now, Carlos, we have, I think, wrapped up this game pretty well and all of our feelings towards it. Um, we have covered the length and breadth of them, but we have not done one thing, and that is covering our man of the match. So I will go first and I will say my man of the match is Eddie Munjoma. I think that Eddie Munjoma did very well as a left wing back, which is not what he's used to. But at the same time, I think where he really showed his ability to help this team out is when at halftime Pacific Nyongabire went off, Eddie Munjoma switched to the right side. Um, it was good that we had both of them. Pacific Nyongabiri has actually also played internationally. Um, I'm not sure why he wasn't called up for this international window now that I think about it, but uh, I'm glad that we had him. So when Eddie Munjoma, who I believe is also eligible for Zimbabwe, um, but I don't know if he has ever received any interest from them. Um, it would be cool if we had another international player, except during those breaks when we would lose them. But yeah, he did very well at the left and then switched to the right side when Pacific went off. So I uh, really appreciated Eddie Munjoma's contribution to this game. And 
I think that he did good both on the uh, defensive side, but also quite a few times on the attacking side. It was unfortunate that those crosses that he got in weren't exactly what we needed because we frequently do use that to good effect, but they weren't in the right place at all times. I think, though, that he more than made up for it with his defensive work. Yeah, it was solid. He He's impressed me a lot this year. I think I was kind of hesi- not, not hesitant. I was just kind of skeptical about what his role was going to be when we randomly signed him the day before a game and then put him in the starting lineup the next day. Um, but he's been really, really good. He's been yeah. quality. He's been serviceable at every position he's played, um, which is more than you can ask from – is all you can ask from anybody when you're kind of bouncing around positions like that. Um, he's done a good job, so shout out to him. Uh, my man of the match was Jordan Doherty. Um, Admittedly, it was pretty hard to pick someone from this game. It was a tough watch, um, as I've said. Um, so it was a weird one. Um, but Jordan Doherty had a solid game in the back line, as per usual. Um, he has been turning into such a fantastic like center back back there. Yeah. Um, it seemed like that wasn't his uh what well, what his position was like by trade. He was always like a defensive midfielder, center midfielder. Um, that's kind of what we knew him as for a majority of his time with the Rowdies. Um, but this year, he's taken up a huge, huge role on that back line, especially now with Forrest Lasso out. He has become a uh, regular back there. Um, and instead of him being kind of like, you know, the plug and play guy, um, it's been a guy like Monjoma who's come in and kind of plug and played back there um, at the, uh, with him on the back line. Because, yeah, Doherty's been so good in the back line consistently uh, this year. Um, that he, again, he's become a regular back there for good reason. So um, a fantastic player, fantastic center back um, who has tr- truly become that a center back. No longer just kind of like the utility guy. Um, he is regularly back there for good reason because he is a fantastic defender who plays. I think I've said this before. He plays taller than he is, if that makes any sense. Um, he's, I think, six foot, um, but he always plays like he's six two, six three. He goes up for those balls, gets on yep. the end of it. Fantastic, fantastic player. Um, you know, maybe we could have asked a bit more from the back line on that Oakland goal. Um, I think it wasn't just the back line's fault. It was a mix there. Um, at one point during the Oakland goal, there was like all three of them bunched up on one guy, which I think led to, uh, who was it? Cedeno, um having an entirely open header. Yep. <laughs> um, but again, like there, there's uh, several people to blame on that one. Like the guy whose name I'm forgetting, who whipped in the ball, the assist guy shouldn't have been that open at all. Um, the wingbacks could have done a bit more there. Like, there's just so much blame to go around on that goal. Um, so I won't put that too much on just the back line. Um, my man of the match, Jordan Doherty, another great game for him. Yeah, and uh, if you are listening to our show, if you are watching our live show, then you should please tell us if we have missed anything when it comes to specifically the man of the match argument, because we could get into that a little bit more i think in other games maybe this one isn't the best one but at the same time i'm sure we are missing something here and there so please do contribute if you have something else to say that we are missing tell us Uh, why james is wrong by the way don't tell me why i'm wrong because i'm always right but james he's got that's true yeah i mean it's what i'm known for when it comes to predictions so I, i wouldn't be i wouldn't be that shocked honestly Uh, Now, Carlos, if you could lead us into the next section, because I believe we have some big news here to talk about. Yes. Oh, my goodness. By the way, um, I almost forgot that this was in my calendar. James, we are not that far out. It is June 11th. That is only, wait, let me do the math, 18 days, something like that. I'm terrible at math. Um, On June 29th, James, you have to get your butt over to Berry House Beer Company off of the Ebor Stripped. In Tampa, it's in Ebor, 7 p.m. against Loudoun United. We'll have an RBLR Rowdies watch party. Um, 6.15 is going to be the live pregame show. Game starts at 7 against the infamous Loudoun United. Um, There's going to be a halftime swag giveaway. Rowdies often contribute to that, and we're going to have stuff over there. Come over, get some free stuff. Again, there's beer pitcher specials. Um, It's going to be so, so much fun. Um, I love doing these watch parties. Um, It's always a blast. Um, and yeah, it's always a great time just to be around other Rowdies fans watching a game, of course. But Ebor is certainly the place you want to be on a weekend. Why not start your weekend off with um, a Rowdies game there? Nice little pregame, 7 p.m. You're out by 9, maybe 9.30. You hit Ebor and enjoy the night. It seems like a good Saturday night to me, James. Again, it's at Berry House Beer Company in Ebor City, um, 1403 East 5th Avenue in Tampa, Florida. We'll have a blast. 
Yeah, folks, we've done it before. If you have been there, you know how fun they can be. So please join us and make it all the same again. We would love to continue hosting these. And Barry House, as far as I'm aware, is enjoying our uh, products back to them, which is taking and buying their products. So <laughs> contribute to that and contribute to the fun times that we can all have together watching the Rowdies. Absolutely. Love, love Barry House. Great yeah. beer, great people, great company. Um, I mean, they are them. literally award-winning with their beer, so you, you can't argue that. Yeah, yeah, be there, be there. All right, now let's get into the game this Saturday night that we are telling you all to attend at Al Lang Stadium. If you haven't heard, now you did. You got to be there. Get to Al Lang because the Rowdies are hosting Louisville City at 7.30 on Saturday. Now, why is it so important? A, we have the history with Louisville that I'm sure everyone listening knows about. If you don't, we will get into it a little bit more. But for now, Louisville have won their last three games and only lost one in the league all year. That is a very good record, as you might be aware. This is going to be a tough <laughs> test, and uh, we're yeah. going to have to see exactly how we do. Back at home, luckily, I think that's going to make it a little bit better for us in the end. Their regular lineup includes Damian Loss in net, Kyle Adams, Arturo Ordonez, and Sean Toach at the back. In the midfield is Jake Morris, Taylor Davila, Elijah Winder, and Aiden McFadden. And uh, up top has mostly been Ray Serrano, Jorge Gonzalez, and Adrian Perez. Um, that does change a little bit. We have seen players like Wilson Harris start up top as the uh, main striker. And um, I, I don't know exactly when the switch was made that Jorge Gonzalez became the main guy, but it has certainly paid off for them. Tampa Bay native Wesley Sharpie has also started in the back. So he's somebody to keep an eye out for. I actually played against him and I'm sure he would remember me if he did at all as one of the worst players he's ever played against. So just keep that in <laughs> mind. Wilson Harris leads the team with 10 goals. That is right, 10 goals ahead of Serrano's five, and three other players on the team have three. So pretty good record there, too. Adrian Perez has five assists, and two other players have three assists on the season as well. Davila, Serrano, and Perez will be the creators. They are leading both the big chances and the regular chances created categories for this team. Um, Carlos, there is something that we need to go over, though. So I'll turn it over to you for the next couple of bits. Yeah, th uh, this is, well, I was going to say fun. It's not fun. It's not a fun update, but it's kind of cool that we got it's this. Helpful. It's helpful. <laughs> it's helpful. It, we, got, we got it live while we're on here. So that's uh, that's a fun one. Um, it's like it's like I'm breaking. It's like I'm a real reporter, James. Wow. It's like I'm putting my journalism minor to use here. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, unfortunately, uh, this doesn't mean he'll be out, but Blake Bodily will be listed as questionable with a hamstring injury um, for this upcoming game against Louisville. Again, Blake Bodily will be listed as questionable with a hamstring injury. Um, so nothing about how minor or major that may be. Um, but I think questionable is better than out. So I'll take yes. that. Um, as a win, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, you take your wins where you get them. I think that's a, um, that's a win for me, I guess. I don't know. Um, hopefully it's nothing major. Hopefully he can play because again, we've talked about how big this guy is to this team. Um, he is a huge, huge contributor to this team and we can't really afford any more injuries. It seems like just when we start to get guys back, just when we start to get guys like Zach Arabo back into the rotation, Leo Fernandez coming back, um, we see guys um, go down and hopefully this Blake Bodley thing, um, is a quick one, and he'll be back with us as soon as possible. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Blake Bodley list is questionable on um, this upcoming weekend with a hamstring injury. Um, looking ahead, also, like we've talked about Louisville a bit here. You've talked about, James, um, who some of their big contributors are. Um, again, you've talked about Wilson Harris, guys, 10 goals. Um, he he was a name that I think not a lot of people knew about when he came into the league, but he just lit up the league. He started off with like a good season when he came here. Uh, the season he's turned it up a notch. Um, he's playing fantastic soccer and he's scoring plenty of goals for Louisville. Um, it's unfortunate for the rest of the league. Fantastic for Louisville. Um, yeah, Louisville plays a similar game to the Rowdies. I think it's going to come down to who does it better. And I think Blake bodily being in or out of this game will be a huge, huge factor in determining that if he is in this game, truly, it's a different performance. Um, that being said, I'm not saying we wouldn't be able to do well um, without him, um, Neon Gabire and Manjoma played a solid enough game against Oakland, but we need a little bit more from the entire team um, than what we had against Oakland if we want a chance at beating arguably the hottest team in the league 
um, with maybe the exception of Indy um, in this one. Always better play at home. Always going to help. Heat's always going to help the local team, you know, mm-hmm. your Tampa Bay Rowdies. Um, and it's been a scorcher the past few weeks. It's extra humid this week. Some rain coming through. Um, I don't think that'll help Louisville's case at all. But again, this is a fantastic team we're up against. We need um, a Sacramento-esque performance to get through this one with three points. Um, we're capable of it, absolutely. Um, but it'll be a tough one. And again, you just need way, way more Um than what we had against Oakland. Um, plenty of great players for this Louisville side. Damien Last, by the way, fantastic goalie came out of nowhere for me. Yep. He's having a fantastic year. MLS Next Pro was like best goalie last season. I mean, he's having a great, great season for Louisville. Um, and made that jump from MLS Next Pro to USL very, very well. Um, yeah, plenty of other great players in there we could talk about for a long time, James. Um, what else do we have in this game? Should we just jump into predictions or do we have anything else to say about this one? Because I'm scared. I'm going to lie. I'm not going to lie. I'm scared. Well, I was going to say, yeah, there there is a lot to be worried about when it comes to Louisville. You guys have already heard the stats here, but I just wanted to dive into that a little bit more because there are it's worth highlighting exactly what we're looking at in terms of their playing style. So they do line up in a pretty similar formation to us. They've got the three at the back. They've got the two wingbacks. They've got two in the central midfield, which is almost exactly what we saw in the first half versus Oakland. It did change in the second half because Pacific Neongabira went off. I guess actually we didn't talk about all of that when we did our review, but we talked about more than enough of the review because that game sucked anyway. So yeah, we would have got to talk about that for the rest of the year. Yeah. I don't, um, but that one. We uh, this past week, we played with Lewis Hilton and Danny Crisostomo as the two more central midfielders. And actually, we saw Danny Crisostomo doing a lot more defensive work than I think I've remembered him from him the last couple of games. He's had a he did great it well, season, too. by the way. Yeah. Um, Lewis Hilton is not a player that I really see Louisville City having a direct corollary for. Taylor Davila is the central midfielder, but I don't know. Well, he doesn't play the exact same way that Lewis Hilton does. No two players generally play the exact same way. That's obvious, but um, they don't they don't fill in the exact same position. And then Elijah Winder is one of their youth players. Uh, his brother Josh Winder was doing so well for the team that after coming through as a teenager, he was sold to Benfica. So, um, some there must be something good running in those genes. I but, love uh, that USL to Europe pipeline. Let's keep that. Yeah, up, by the way. yeah. Take that absolutely. MLS. We're here, baby. <laughs> come on, come on. But um, yeah, so the other big thing here, if we can shut down Elijah Winder and Taylor Davila in a good way, that will be positive because naturally that is where a lot of the plays are going to start before they actually get to the chance creators, which again are going to be Davila in the middle. Uh, Ray Serrano and Adrian Perez, you can kind of think of them if you think of the way that Danny Crisostomo has been combining on the right side with whoever is the right wing back and then Cal Jennings up top. Think of... Uh, think of Adrian Perez as that kind of player. And then on the left side, if you look at Josh Perez, um, that will be their Ray Serrano. He'll be the player who's a little bit more in the central position and then al- allows the players on the left side. So that would be Jake Morris. And frequently it'll be Taylor Davila to help uh, in the attack for Louisville City. Shutting them down, like I said, will be very important. And that is going to come down to probably Danny Crisostomo sitting a lot more defensively again doing that type of role and helping out with Lewis Hilton. I'm going to expect that we're going to see a lot of defensive work similarly from Cal Jennings and Manuel Arteaga. If they're up there, if they're both starting up top, they're going to have to do that again. And then uh, if Josh Perez starts, then we know that he does the more defensive work because he sits a little bit deeper than those two do anyway. Uh, On the left side, if Blake Bodley is questionable, it's worth pondering just a little bit who is going to st- take up that role. Eddie yeah. Manjoma does do well in that role, but because he's not naturally left-footed, I think that his uh, he's a little bit more conservative going down the left side because he can't whip a ball in the way that we all would hope that he could just because it's not on his dominant foot naturally. Blake Bodley, it's perfect for him. It's on his left foot. He can do it like that. 
Who else could do that? Well, there's one other player that I can think of immediately, and I don't know if this is an immediate option for us because of his injuries recently, and that is Leo Fernandez. Leo Fernandez, let's not forget, in Sebastian Guanzotti's MVP season, should have been an MVP season. I don't think that he actually won the MVP that year, but he was the MVP for our team, certainly. Uh, that is when Leo Fernandez was the left wing back for the Rowdies under Neil Collins. So, yeah. Um, it's an option. We haven't seen him do that in a very long time. And the likelihood of that is pretty low. I'll just throw that out there now. So the other yeah. one that I think we're more likely to see is Nick moon. Nick moon was originally brought in, I believe to be the right wing back for this team. Injuries prevented him from doing that. And that's when we brought in Eddie Manjoma. He's obviously done very well. Pacific Nyonga Biri has done very well there. Uh, and, so if Nick Moon slides over to the left, like we've seen him do quite a few times when he's made appearances, then maybe that would be a more attacking option than Eddie Munjoma, just because he is more naturally an attacking player, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is the only other thing that I wanted to highlight is just if Blake Bodley actually is out of this game, which we're all hoping he's not, then we'll see what it turns into and exactly how that leads us into playing against Louisville. But yeah, yeah now, Carlos, I think we can do our predictions. I, I will say on um, Nick Moon, by the way, fantastic player. I think he would be fantastic there as well. Yeah. Um, I just I will point out that he wasn't uh obviously he didn't start, but he wasn't on the bench for either the Sacramento or Oakland game. Um I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't think he's injured. I knew he was coming back from an injury. Maybe he just didn't make this trip. I'm not fully aware. I don't really know. He to my knowledge, he wasn't in the injury report, James, right? No, he, I don't yeah, I don't remember seeing that if he yeah. was. So um, keep that in mind as well. Wasn't uh, with the team, or at least on the bench, um, for the last two games in California. Again, he was uh, with. He came off the bench against Las Vegas the week before at home. So maybe he just didn't make this trip for whatever reason. Um, who knows? Wasn't an injury report. So um, yeah, um, if he's with the team this weekend, that would be a nice boost as well because he yeah. is incredibly talented, fantastic wing back as well, um, and I think. If for a game like this, I absolutely would take him starting over there over Leo personally, um, just because I feel like um, he might be better, a bit better defensively um, for a team that's going to come at us with, with everything they have offensively. Yeah. Um, and that, I, I think I would, if I'm Robbie Nielsen, maybe err on the side of caution and be a bit more conservative in terms of, you know, preventing Louisville's attack from running rampant on the wings. Um, okay. That being said, Plenty of little variables, as we've mentioned, um, for the Rowdies um, going into this week. Um, but I think we can, like you said, just jump into the predictions. Um, I'm always the optimist, so I'm going to continue with that role, James. And despite a really shaky performance this past weekend, um, I think we can hold off and get a 1-0 win. Okay. Um, these games against big teams seem to never be barn burners even though they very well could be um <laughs> like louisville louisville scored a lot of goals in the past few games um they also had random games where they don't put up anything offensively i think back to that game against rhode island when they were away to rhode island they had kind of a, a, an oakland-esque performance for us um slow not really much going for them zero zero was the final result for them over there um against a really really poor rhode island team um, obviously, we're a much better side than Rhode Island, um, but they—I wouldn't put it past them to play down and play up to their opposition as well. Um, they have full, full reason to be playing full intensity against a really good Rowdy squad. Um, and I'll say the same about the Rowdies versus Louisville. Um, but because of that, it feels like these big games against big opponents always tend to be close games, um, often one goal games. So why not? I'm going to go with the one nothing win. Um, the back line's playing solid. There was really not any mistakes in the past few games with the exception of the one big one, unfortunately that led to Oakland's goal. Um, so I, I wouldn't put it past us to be able to come out of there um, with a shutout um, and get some random goal um, from one of our big goal scorers. Um, hopefully Kyle Jennings um, finds that form that's characterized most of the year for him um, and gets a nice, you know, long ball chasing down whatever goal. Um, yeah. I don't think it's impossible. I think we can come out with a win. Um, at home in front of our fans in the heat in the humidity always tough for Louisville to come down here no matter um, how great they're doing um, always seems to be a challenge for them um, in Tampa Bay 
Well, Carlos, I do appreciate your optimism. As per usual, I'm going to hedge my bet against the result and go with something that, like you said, would not be a barn burner of a, of a result. But I will say that we draw this game one to one. And on the other side, there is the producer Eureka prediction here. And uh, he has gone with you a win for the Rowdies two to one specifically. Love Eureka. Eureka always being it. Eureka's like, like, the middle ground between you and I, I think. I feel like he goes back and forth between going with the Carlos win and the James draw. Like, it's very rare to see Eureka predict an L, but when James predicts an L, Eureka's usually in the middle. I'll predict the win, Eureka predicts the draw. Yeah. Nice little middle ground there. Um, okay, James, that's the Louisville game. Um, that's about it. Any concluding thoughts here before we jump into the extra time? No, let's jump in. There's a whole bunch to get to, so we might as well do it. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff going on. Um, by the way, the soccer tournament was going on. That just wrapped up yesterday. That was awesome. Um, it was the the U.S. women team that uh, won the women's tournament and a team sponsored by an indoor soccer field in Delaware called La Bombonera uh, that won the men's tournament. That's always a fun time. Um, I actually really enjoyed watching it. Um, it's pretty fun. Uh, seven on seven soccer. It's high, you know, high pace. A bunch of random little crossovers between college soccer alums and, and college alumni team and, and soccer legends and Pat McAfee mispronouncing CONCACAF leading to his team being called CONCAFA FC. Like that was fun. He's gotten a really nice assist, like just a bunch of random stuff going on um, with the soccer tournament. Uh, and it was a good time. Um, the Tampa Bay Sun, by the way, had a team um, in this one and sadly bowed out of the tournament with a 4-0 loss to the U uh, S women's national team. Uh, but still team. lose to the champions. If you're going to lose to anybody. Yeah. And, and they lost in the semifinals, too, I believe. So um, just a couple wins out, sadly, um, from a million dollars, which would have been nice for the team. Yeah. Um, this is a fun piece of news here, James, that you threw in here. I didn't know about this. Um, New Mexico United is set to charter a flight for a bunch of its fans to its Open Cup game in July. Um, that's a fun one. Um, I've heard about teams doing this in the past. Um, this is really cool. I always like seeing things like this happen. I wish more teams would do it. Yeah. Um, it's really just for ma making it as easy as possible. Um, as easy as a long trip like that can be um, for fans to be at big games. Um, and not, obviously, you know, great experience for the fans, but that always helps your team, always. Um, that's really fun to see. So uh, shout out to them for doing that. Good luck to them in the Open Cup. Um, I'm putting on my USL hat, um, obviously, for the rest of the tournament, as I have been for most of the tournament. Yep. Um, shout out USL, go USL. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's long overdue for a lower division team to win that tournament. I, man, you you are telling me. Um, we will move on to a little bit of international news here. Congratulations to Dayon Harris. He made his international debut for the Antigua and Barbuda national team. He came on as a second half substitute in their first game of this window, and then he did not play in the second win or game of this window. I don't know why they ended up losing that game. So that does suck, but still he made his debut and congratulations to him. I'm sure that was awesome. Uh, I hope it was anyway. And a uh, little bit of other news. There was Joe Jaya Quizera, who scored for Rwanda in their win today. He is from the uh, team up in Rhode Island. So a little bit of a uh, little bit of USL connection there. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. I was mentioning earlier how Iracose Donaciano, he played for Burundi. Pacific Nyongabire did not get called up for this one. I don't know why, but good enough for us. And um, it would be interesting to see more players play. Um, like I said, I believe Eddie Munjoma is eligible for Zimbabwe. I don't know if there's any connection there or if they have ever reached out. But yeah, it's it's just really cool to watch the international game and follow it closely because you do get these random connections like that, that I, I just pop up out of nowhere. And uh, I, I personally track it way too closely. So um, I thought that it was really cool, but Carlos, I'll turn it back over to you for a little more international news, actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was kind of a last second thing for a variety of reasons. I just came across this today um, and saw that the Venezuelan national team is training at the Rowdies complex all this week until they head out um, to San Jose for their first Copa America game against none other than my Ecuador national team. Um, yeah, you, uh, Venezuela is playing, uh, sorry, training at the Rowdies Complex basically all week. Um, there is some reports that I saw from some Venezuelan soccer reporters um, that said that they were originally set to set up their base in Bradenton, um, be playing, sorry, training at uh, IMG Academy's fields for the rest of the week before heading over to San Jose out in California. Um, 
uh, for whatever reason, well, I know the reason there's a bunch of rain and the fields over there were not training pretty well. Um, and they ended up, uh, over here in Tampa and they're training at the Rowdies facility on waters. So that's kind of fun. Um, if you drive by that waters Avenue complex, um, throughout the week, maybe you see, um, some Vino Tinto players over there, some big names over there. Um, I don't know. Stop by the Wawa. Check Hopefully out some Manuel of their Arteaga practice. can say hi too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Rowdies are also practicing there, um, in the mornings as per usual. Um, so, uh, that's kind of fun. Rowdies coming out of practice, Venezuela coming in, um, <laughs> The waters complex um they also have one session of practice uh i think in the morning on thursday at al lang stadium i saw on their like official you know schedule um who knows i uh, that'd be kind of fun if you're in the area at al lang pass by um, see the vino tinto over there um yeah super random super cool um always fun to see some big names passing through the rowdy's halls um yeah good luck to venezuela and the Copa america they have a really likable team. I really like the Venezuelan national team. If yeah. I could pick my two to come out of that group, obviously I'm taking Ecuador, but I would love Venezuela to come join us in the next round. With all Plus due that respect, would mean Mexico is out. Yeah, I was going to say with all due respect to my Mexican friends um, <laughs> and, and associates, but yeah, it'd be really fun to see Mexico get knocked out, um, which, by the way, is highly possible. Like Venezuela is, I think, a better team than Mexico. The way Mexico has been playing, I wouldn't put it past them um, to get knocked out in the group stage. Who knows what Jamaica? Jamaica is always a hit or miss. Um, I think it's a really interesting group to keep an eye on for the Copa America. Ecuador, Venezuela, Jamaica, Mexico. Um, it's going to be a fun one. Um, and certainly, I don't think there's any really any givens here, except maybe Jamaica not making it out of the group stage. But they can take some points away from these other teams. So who knows what will happen there. Um, also, USA is playing. The U.S. men's national team is playing in Orlando tomorrow. Um, if you're listening to this live tomorrow is uh, Wednesday. Um, if you're listening to this when it comes out tomorrow, then it'll be today. Um, if you're going to that, uh, hit me up. I'll be over there. It'll be fun. I'll be over there with my dad. Uh, we can grab a drink before the game or something. It'll be a fun one. Brazil's coming out with all their starters from what I understand. So yep. um, expect a, a showcase. I, <laughs> I I don't really know what to say. I don't have a ton of positive things to say about uh, the U.S. men's national team after that last game. Um, so let's go in there and have some fun. Why not? Um, it'll be a fun one. Brazil's fantastic right now. They're in great form. Um, and yeah, go America right on the corner. It's going to be a blast. Um, other than that, Euro's coming up as well. Keep an eye on that. So much soccer coming up this summer. Um, it's quite literally my favorite time of year. Yes. Um, it's so much fun. I, even though it comes at the cost of, you know, some rowdy soccer taking a break with all this international break stuff. Uh, it's a little less rowdy soccer, a little less domestic league soccer, um, but a lot more um, of these big names playing for their national teams. And that's always a fun time. Ecuador and the U.S. in the same tournament. It's rare. I'm really excited. Um, we'll see what happens. Yep. I am so excited about all of this stuff that we just went over. And uh, I am going to be at as many games as I can, which might not be that many. But regardless, it will still be a good number of them. So thank you listeners for tuning in this week. We always appreciate when you do. And also when you join us on this live stream that we have now been doing recently, I think that it is going well. So please follow us if you can, then you will get notifications of our live streams when we go up at RBLR Sports. You can do that on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, threads, pretty much anywhere that you are, we are too. Also on YouTube, but if you'd like to get at me, I am mostly on Twitter at RBLR James K. What about you, Carlos? At Carlos GPA 10 on Twitter. Um, come join me. Come see me tweet about the US tomorrow. We'll see how it goes. Um, I got to take some rowdies here to Orlando. I can't go to Orlando and not wear like a rowdies hat, scarf, something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll be over there. It'll be fun. Let me know if you're going. We'll have a good time. There you go. And please like and subscribe to our podcast, of course. Like I said, you can get the full experience on YouTube where you will see our faces along with the live stream. And you can hear us if that's what you are prefer or if that's what you would prefer on Spotify, iHeartRadio app, Apple, Google Podcasts, wherever you are, we are too. Now for a boring game out of the way and a hopeful barn burner coming up this weekend. Come on, you rowdies.
Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.